You're listening to Chasing, where the truth is often stranger than fiction. I'm your host, and today we're stepping into the quiet town of Troy, Missouri, where the unthinkable happened on a cold December night in 2011. Betsy Feria, a loving wife and mother, was found murdered in her home just days after Christmas. Her husband, Russ, returned to discover a horrifying scene and made a desperate call for help. But what seemed like an open and shut case quickly unraveled, exposing secrets, lies, and betrayals that no one saw coming. How could a devoted husband become the prime suspect in his wife's murder? And what dark forces were at play? This is the story of a twisted search for justice and the chilling events that turned one family's world upside down. Russ Feria's life had always been centered around family and community. Raised in the suburbs of St. Louis by an Italian mother and a Portuguese father, Russ was instilled with the values of loyalty, love, and perseverance from an early age. His family's tight-knit bond was something he carried with him throughout his life, shaping the man he would become. In 1998, Russ's path crossed with Betsy's at a gas station in O'Fallon, Missouri. Betsy, a vibrant and bubbly woman with two daughters from a previous relationship, Leah and Mariah, was instantly drawn to Russ's down-to-earth personality. Despite the challenges of blending their families, the couple quickly fell in love and began building a life together. That gas station was probably the closest convenience store to where I lived, so I was in there quite a bit, Russ recalled. We started chatting and we hit it off. One thing led to another, and we ended up dating and getting married. Their relationship blossomed quickly, and in 2000, they were married, marking the beginning of a new chapter in both of their lives. Russ and Betsy moved to Troy, Missouri, a small town where they hoped to create a stable and happy home for their family. With Betsy's daughters, Leah and Mariah, in tow, the couple settled into a routine, navigating the complexities of a blended family. Like many marriages, theirs had its ups and downs. They separated a few times over the years, but they always found their way back to each other. Their bond grew even stronger after Betsy was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2010. The diagnosis was a devastating blow, but it also brought them closer together. We had gotten things back on track, Russ said. We were going to a new church, and it was the best years of our relationship those last four or five years. The couple found solace in their faith and in each other as they faced the uncertainty of Betsy's health. Despite undergoing a mastectomy in 2010, the cancer spread to Betsy's liver by 2011. The prognosis was grim, with doctors estimating that she had three to five years left to live. This news shook the family to its core but it also strengthened their resolve to make the most of the time they had left together. Russ became Betsy's rock, supporting her through the grueling chemotherapy sessions and the emotional toll of living with a terminal illness. The couple's commitment to each other during this difficult time was evident to those around them. They attended church together, and Russ often spoke about how their renewed faith had helped them navigate the challenges they faced. It seemed that, Despite the hardships, they were more in love than ever. December 27, 2011, began like any other day for the couple, but it would end in tragedy. Betsy had a chemotherapy appointment scheduled for that afternoon, a routine she had grown accustomed to over the past year. Despite the toll the treatments were taking on her body, Betsy remained determined to fight the cancer with everything she had. Pamela Hupp, a woman who had once been just an acquaintance, had become more involved in Betsy's life following her diagnosis. Pam and Betsy had worked together at State Farm years earlier and reconnected when Betsy's health began to decline. Although they weren't particularly close before, Pam seemed eager to help Betsy in any way she could. This sudden closeness raised eyebrows among Betsy's family and friends, but no one could have predicted the dark turn it would take. Pam grew up in a seemingly ordinary Catholic household in Delwood, Missouri, as the third of four children. 
Her father was a union man at Union Electric, and her mother was a school teacher. Friends remembered Pam as a fun-loving girl, always ready for a laugh, but they also noted that she was boy crazy and didn't always take school seriously. By her senior year, she had made a real catch in a soft-spoken, well-liked boy, and they attended prom together. However, three months later, they had to get married, marking the beginning of a life filled with unexpected turns. Pam's first marriage didn't last, and soon after, she married Mark Hupp, a former minor league baseball player turned carpenter. The couple moved to Naples, Florida in 1989 and returned to O'Fallon, Missouri in 2001, where they started flipping houses. Pam also took a clerical job at State Farm, where she met Betsy. Despite the challenges of their lives, Pam and Mark seemed to live a quiet, uneventful life, at least on the surface. On December 27th, Pam insisted on driving Betsy to her chemotherapy appointment, despite the fact that Betsy's mother's house was closer to the clinic. Pam's insistence on being the one to drive Betsy home later would raise suspicions, especially given the events that would soon unfold. Russ finished work and left home around 5 p.m., planning to spend the evening at his friend Mike Corbin's house. On his way, he made several stops. He got gas at the Conoco station in Troy, bought cigarettes at a U-Gas in Wentzville, purchased dog food at Green's Country Store in Lake St. Louis, and grabbed two bottles of iced tea at a quick trip. Each of these stops was recorded on camera, providing a clear timeline of his movements. Meanwhile, Betsy had undergone her chemotherapy session and, after some initial hesitation, agreed to let Pam drive her home. Pam claimed that Betsy had requested the ride, though text messages between Betsy and Russ suggested that Betsy had initially planned for Russ to pick her up. When Betsy arrived at her mother's apartment in Lake St. Louis, she spent some time playing upwards with her mother and a family friend, Bobby Wan. Eventually, Pam arrived and waited patiently for Betsy to finish the game before driving her home to Troy. Pam later recounted that she dropped Betsy off around 7 p.m., a timeline that would be crucial in the investigation that followed. According to Pam, she watched Betsy enter the house before driving back to her home in O'Fallon. However, as details of that night emerged, it became clear that Pam's account was far from reliable. Around 9 p.m., Russ left Mike Corbin's house after watching movies with his friends. He stopped at an Arby's on the way home, picking up two junior cheddar melts to eat during the drive. When he arrived home around 9.40 p.m., he was greeted by a sight that would haunt him forever. Betsy was lying on the living room floor, her body surrounded by blood. Russ initially thought she might have fallen ill, but as he knelt beside her, he realized the horrific truth. Betsy's wrists were slashed and a knife was lodged in her throat. In a state of shock and disbelief, Russ dialed 911, telling the operator that he believed Betsy had taken her own life. King County 911, what is the location of your emergency? <laughs> okay, ma'am. Hello? Hello? Yes, I need you to take a couple deep breaths so I can see what's going on. What is the address where you need this to come? One, 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 one thirty C Mac. Okay, what, um, what is the telephone number you're calling from in case we get disconnected? Uh, I, I don't know this number. I know my cell phone number. Okay, what is that number? It's, it's, it's 304-565. Okay, who am I speaking with? My name is Russell Faria. Russell, what's going on there? I just got home from a friend's house, and, and my wife, my wife killed herself. She's, she's, she's on the phone. Okay, Russell, I need you to calm down, honey, okay? I need you to calm down, take a couple deep breaths. We're going to get somebody on the way there, okay? <laughs> what What did she do? Do you know? She got a knife in her neck and she slashed her arms. 
<laughs> okay, okay, calm down, honey. <laughs> Is she breathing at all? No. She is not breathing? No, there's a bunch of more. I'm okay. okay. Russell, is there anybody that we can call for you? Call, call. Where my mom? Okay, Russell, take a couple deep breaths on, okay? Okay, what is your mom's name? I'm I'm sorry, I can't understand you, hon. Lucy. Lucy? And what's your last name? Maria. How old is your wife? Well, she's 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 forty two. Thirty two? Forty two. Forty two. Okay, and you're for sure she's not breathing right now? No, you did. Okay. What is your mother's phone number? My phone number is 636-265. Okay. <laughs> okay, they're on the way, honey. They're just calm down for me, okay? <laughs> Russell, how long were you gone today? I, I, I left around five. And I just got back. But she was at her mom's and her friend was bringing her home, so I don't know what time she got home. And you said that, uh... <laughs> Has she been depressed lately? <laughs> She's got, she's got, she's got, she's got cancer. She is, but she does have cancer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what where, to where, do. Russell, where's the knife now? It's, 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 it's in the I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said, hon. It's still in her. It's laying right next to her? No, it's in her neck. It's in her neck? Okay. <laughs> Okay, they'll be there shortly. <laughs> Is there anybody else there in the house with you? No, no, there's nobody else here. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> Russell, take a couple deep breaths, honey, okay? Is she on any was she on any medication? Okay, can you do me a favor? What I need you to do is I need to get those I need you to get those medications for the paramedics, okay? I think they're here on the table. Yeah, we have we have everybody coming to you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but what I need you to do is take a couple deep breaths and try to get her medication together, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. <laughs> oh, no. 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 Russell, where where are her medications? I think they're on the table. They're on the table. Okay, where? Here. There's the pill bottles here. I think these are it. Okay, where is she in the house? She's 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 in the living room. In the living room. Okay. Where are you right now? Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> My God. Oh, my God. Oh, God. God. Russell, they're on the way, hon, okay? Oh, my God. Just... Oh, God. Oh, God. Please, oh, God. Russell, take a couple deep breaths, okay? I don't need you hyperventilating, okay? Oh, my God. What am I going to do? Oh, my God. What is her name? Her name is Betsy. Betsy? Yes. Oh, Betsy. No. Oh, my God, no. No, her friend dropped. She went to her friend's house and her friend dropped her off. She was at her mom's house. At her mom's house and her friend dropped her off. her friend was going to bring her home from her mom's house. <laughs> Oh, my God. They're on the way, hon. What am I going to do? Just go ahead and wait for them to get there, okay? I don't know what to do. Oh, my God. Oh. Russell, she, do you think that she's beyond help right now? I think she's dead. Okay. Oh, my God. God. Okay, just take a couple deep breaths for me, honey. If you need to, step outside, okay? Russell. Take a couple deep breaths, honey, okay? I'm trying. Oh, my God, no. Oh, my God. Do you have dogs outside? My, my dog, my dog. He's on the chain. Okay. He's in the backyard. Okay. He's <laughs> oh. Russell, I have a couple officers that are out there right now. Can you do me a favor and open your front door? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's unlocked. It's unlocked. Okay, can you go meet him at the door? It's unlocked. It's unlocked. Russell, are the officers inside with you now? Oh, my God. Yeah, right here. Okay, well, good luck to you, honey. I'm going to go ahead and hang up, and we're going to try to call your mom, okay? okay. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. First responders arrived quickly, but it was immediately apparent that Betsy's injuries were not self-inflicted. Her body was cold and stiff, the result of having been dead for several hours. The sheer brutality of the attack. Betsy had been stabbed 55 times left the police with little doubt that this was a murder. Despite the overwhelming evidence pointing to foul play, the initial investigation quickly zeroed in on Russ as the prime suspect. The crime scene was chaotic. The house was in disarray, with crusty saucepans in the sink and shopping bags, snowmen and Santas scattered around the bloody corpse. A search turned up Russ's slippers, tan suede scuffs thrown atop a pile toward the back of his closet. Blood stained the top of one shoe's right toe area, splotched the right side, and ran along one side of the other scuff. The first officer on the scene, Lincoln County Sheriff's Deputy Chris Hollingsworth, noted that Russ was visibly upset but had limited tears coming from his eyes. Hollingsworth described Russ as appearing to be in a state of panic, having difficulty talking and breathing. On the 911 call, Russ had moaned, no, 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 and then, my God, oh my God, oh my God. 
but as the operator told him to calm down and get his wife's medicines, his voice steadied, and he seemed to be moving around the house. This behavior, coupled with his emotional outbursts and moments of calm, struck the police as suspicious. They couldn't understand why he hadn't embraced his wife, who was lifeless, her tongue hanging out and a knife sticking out of her throat. When Russ was left alone in the police car, he seemed to calm down, chatting normally with Hollingsworth about the neighborhood where they both grew up. This, too, struck the police as suspicious. Russ's behavior didn't fit their expectations of how a grieving husband should act, and they began to see him as their prime suspect. As the investigation continued, the focus on Russ intensified. The day after Betsy's murder, December 28th, Russ was taken to the Lake St. Louis Police Department for a polygraph test. The test results indicated deception when he was asked whether he had killed Betsy or knew who did. Based on these results, detectives began to harden their tone, directly accusing him of the murder. Russ, exhausted and overwhelmed, maintained his innocence, repeating his story, I found her like that when I got home. I walked in the door and found her. Despite his consistent account and the alibi provided by his friends, who swore he had been with them all evening, the police were convinced they had their man. While Russ was being interrogated, two officers were dispatched to interview Pam Hupp. It was early in the morning of December 28th, and when they arrived at her home, Pam answered the door with wet hair, claiming she had just finished showering. She mentioned that she had also showered the night before after dropping Betsy off, a detail that seemed odd to the officers. Pam's interview was filled with inconsistencies. Initially, she claimed she hadn't gone inside the Feria home when she dropped Betsy off, but she later changed her story, stating that she had indeed entered the house to turn on a light and to look at a jewelry cabinet Russ had given Betsy for Christmas. She also provided the officers with disturbing details, such as Betsy's alleged fear of Russ, and a document supposedly written by Betsy that described her fears in detail. However, Pam admitted that she had never seen the document herself, but somehow knew its contents. Pam also brought up the recent change in Betsy's life insurance policy, in which Betsy had made Pam the sole beneficiary just days before her murder. Pam explained this by saying that Betsy didn't trust her daughters or Russ to manage the money responsibly. This, combined with her claims about Russ's violent temper, painted a picture of a troubled marriage and a husband capable of murder. Russ, on the other hand, was subjected to hours of intense interrogation. Over the course of ten and a half hours, Russ told a consistent story about his whereabouts that night including the multiple stops to and from Corbin's house. The detectives, however, focused on what they saw as inconsistencies in his behavior and statements. A medical examiner said she was stabbed 55 times, her arms nearly severed, most of the stabbings after she was dead. A crime of passion. When you stab somebody over 50 times, it's usually a crime of passion, a husband or wife. I felt right away it was, his, it was Russ. The immediate suspect, the husband, Russ Faria. For the first time, you're hearing and seeing evidence like the 911 tape and interrogations. You no. have been stabbed over 25 times. Oh Russ. my God, no. 25 times. Over 25 times. And they're not done yet. They're still old. They're still counting. The major case squad questioned him for days. God is in this room with us right now. And God knows that I did not do this. He did not back down. I did not do this. I did not do it. They pointed to the fact that he hadn't hugged Betsy's body or expressed his grief in the way they expected. They also noted that his clothes were clean and that there was no blood on his body, fingernail clippings, or clothing. Facts that should have pointed to his innocence, but were instead twisted into evidence against him. Later analysis would confirm that there was no DNA from Betsy on Russ's clothes, feet, or hands. Despite this, the detectives remained convinced that Russ was their man. On January 4, 2012, Russell Faria was charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action. As the investigation continued, 
Pam Hupp's role in the case grew more prominent. She cooperated fully with the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office, providing DNA samples, fingerprints, and even details about her trash pickup schedule. Pam's willingness to assist the authorities, coupled with her damning statements about Russ, made her a key witness for the prosecution. However, as Russ's defense attorney, Joel Schwartz, began to dig deeper into the case, he found numerous red flags. Schwartz was struck by how much of the evidence seemed to point toward Pam Hupp rather than Russ. Pam was the last person to see Betsy alive, and she had been made the sole beneficiary of Betsy's life insurance policy just days before the murder. Schwartz also noted that the blood on Russ's slippers, one of the prosecution's key pieces of evidence, looked more like it had been planted than accidentally smeared. The slippers were found in a closet, and there was no evidence that Russ had walked through blood while wearing them. This led Schwartz to suspect that someone, possibly Pam, had staged the scene to frame Russ. Despite these glaring issues, the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office and the prosecution remained focused on Russ. Pam's inconsistent and often implausible accounts were never seriously challenged. Meanwhile, Pam continued to insert herself into the investigation, offering details that seemed to change with each telling. Schwartz worked tirelessly to build a defense that would exonerate Russ. He brought in experts to testify about the timing of the murder, which would have made it nearly impossible for Russ to have committed the crime. He also highlighted the lack of physical evidence linking Russ to the murder and pointed to the numerous inconsistencies in Pam's story. One of the most significant pieces of evidence that Schwartz uncovered was the document that Pam had mentioned during her interview with the police. This document, allegedly written by Betsy, detailed her fear of Russ and her desire to change the beneficiary of her life insurance policy. However, when Schwartz's forensic computer expert examined the document, they found that it was the only document on Betsy's laptop with an unknown author. It had also been created using Microsoft Word 97 software, which wasn't even installed on Betsy's computer. This, combined with other suspicious details, strongly suggested that the document had been fabricated, possibly by Pam herself. Russ had what seemed to be an airtight alibi. Every Tuesday night, like clockwork, he spent the evening with his four friends. But during the trial, Prosecutor Leah Askey painted a very different picture. She claimed that Russ's friends weren't just witnesses to his whereabouts. They were accomplices in what she called the ultimate role play. According to Askey, they plotted the entire scheme with one of Russ's friends, Brandon Sweeney, playing a key role. Askey told the jury that Russ had orchestrated the murder plot with his friend's help. She argued that Sweeney held on to Russ's phone so it would ping in O'Fallon, Missouri at 8.57 p.m., creating a false trail for investigators. Then, she claimed, Sweeney drove through an Arby's, getting a receipt time-stamped at 9.09 p.m., all while Russ was supposedly 30 minutes away, committing the murder. Despite this theory, the defense faced a major roadblock. Judge Christina Menemeyer refused to let Russ's attorney, Joel Schwartz, present critical evidence that pointed to another suspect, Pam Hupp. Schwartz was blocked from introducing cell phone records, showing Hupp had been near the Feria house for up to 30 minutes after she claimed to have left. Even more shocking, the jury never heard that just before her death, Betsy had made Hupp the sole beneficiary of her life insurance policy. This left many questions unanswered as the trial unfolded. On November 21, 2013, Russ Faria was convicted of murdering his wife, Betsy, and sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years without the possibility of parole. Despite a key part of the prosecution's argument being that Russ's four friends had conspired with him in an elaborate cover-up, none of them were ever charged. As Russ sat behind bars, his defense attorney, Joel Schwartz, refused to give up. In December 2013, Schwartz filed a motion for a new trial, but Judge Christina Menemeyer denied the request. However, just a month later, 
the case gained the attention of local media. KTVY and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch teamed up to investigate the case, and by February 2014, they had uncovered shocking new information. It was revealed that Pam Hupp, the last person to see Betsy alive, had kept the $150,000 from Betsy's life insurance policy instead of putting it into a trust for Betsy's daughters, as she had promised. Hupp's credibility was further questioned when inconsistencies in her police interviews came to light. Initially, she claimed she hadn't entered the Feria home after dropping Betsy off, but she later changed her story. Twice. Meanwhile, questions surrounding the integrity of the investigation continued to emerge. The 911 operator, who took Russ's frantic call the night of the murder, believed he had been genuinely shocked and upset. Something that contradicted the prosecution's portrayal of Russ as a calculated killer. Even more troubling, reports surfaced that prosecutor Leah Askey had allegedly been in a relationship with Mike Lang, the captain of investigations for the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office and a key witness in Russ's trial. Two jurors later came forward, stating that this information had been withheld from them during deliberations. In August 2015, as the case remained in the spotlight, a woman from Iowa named Robin Taylor was charged with misdemeanor harassment for calling Pam Hupp and accusing her of killing Betsy. Amid these revelations, Joel Schwartz filed an appeal, and in February 2015, the Missouri Court of Appeals ordered a hearing on a possible retrial. By June, Judge Menemeyer recused herself, and the case was reassigned to Judge Stephen Omer, who granted a new trial based on the evidence that had emerged. Russ Feria was released on bond while awaiting his retrial. During the retrial, Schwartz was finally allowed to introduce evidence implicating Pam Hupp as an alternative suspect. CSI agent Amy Buettner, who had examined the crime scene, testified that the blood found on the slippers in Russ's closet didn't appear to come from stepping in blood, as the prosecution had suggested. Police officers also disclosed new details about Hupp's behavior. In recent interviews, Hupp claimed that she and Betsy had been in a sexual relationship and that, on the night of the murder, she had seen Russ and another man sitting in a car outside the Faria home, details she had remembered much later in the investigation. On November 7, 2015, Russ Faria's conviction was overturned, and after nearly four years in prison, he walked free, finally exonerated of the crime he had always insisted he did not commit. Russ was finally free, but the story didn't end there. After Russ Faria was exonerated in 2015, suspicions surrounding Pam Hupp began to grow. Despite Russ's release, authorities had overlooked key evidence that could have implicated Hupp in Betsy Faria's 2011 murder. By 2016, Hupp found herself facing increased scrutiny, and in a desperate attempt to divert attention, she concocted an elaborate scheme to stage a kidnapping. On August 10, 2016, Carol McAfee, also known as Carol Alford, made a bold decision to get into Pam Hupp's car, suspecting that Hupp was up to no good. Hupp approached Carol at her trailer park in O'Fallon, Missouri, claiming she was a Dateline producer looking for someone to reenact a 911 call. Although Hupp's story raised red flags, such as asking Carol not to bring her phone or wallet, and using a car with local Missouri plates. Carol's curiosity and concern for the safety of neighborhood kids led her to go along with it. Before getting into Hupp's car, Carol prepared herself by hiding two knives in her clothes, despite Pam's instructions not to bring anything. She also briefly called 911, but locked her phone before the call was answered. As they drove, Carol became increasingly suspicious when Hupp said she was taking her to a rental house. Yet Carol knew there were no houses in the area they were headed. Sensing danger, Carol asked to go back home under the pretense of needing shoes, which Pam reluctantly agreed to. Once inside, Carol called her son for help, 
and decided to cancel the supposed 911 call reenactment, telling Pam she had to pick up her son. Pam became frustrated, but after noticing security cameras and hearing Carol warn her that she had a knife and would call 911, Hupp eventually left. Carol reported the encounter to police, giving them critical information, including surveillance footage of Hupp's car and license plate. Tragically, just six days later, Pam Hupp lured another victim, 33-year-old Louis Gumpenberger, into a deadly trap. The following are police speaking to Carol about her incident with Pam and Pam's 911 call regarding Louis. 911, what's your emergency? Hey, hello, there's someone breaking in my house. Help! What's the address you're at? Get out! What do you mean, she did you, what do you mean, she's your wife? I'm getting in the car with you, no. Get out, get out, get out!
she'd have tried something stupid, she'd have been the one hurt. She drives, instead of backing out of my driveway, which is weird, and going back towards the main drag there, yeah. you know, like, she pulls out and she drives around Sorrel. And she's talking about, oh, you know, I don't know why the, this is the neighborhood the producers chose, these two trailer parks. This is, so where are you doing this? She's like, oh, they have a trailer that your park managers already approved for us to use in one of the new homes that they just set up to record it. And I was like, funny, because they had to have been paying attention because we've had several new homes come to the park. So I'm like, okay. And she's like, and I actually just dropped off one of your neighbors and she mentioned Cole Circle. I was like, okay. So she's she's driven around the neighborhood. She knows that there's there's really like four streets that are red Sorrel or Cole. And I can't remember the other one. So anyway, we'll get to Sorrel. She turns like she's leaving the park. So I'm just making chit chat with her. We get about like right there where the Rolling Meadows sign is. We get like maybe two courts up. And then I said, so exactly where are we going to go to record this? She says in the neighborhood across from the shops in Lake St. Louis. First thing that came to my mind is, you lying bitch. The only thing across the shops at Lake St. Louis is the highway. I said, crap. I said, I forgot my shoes that I wanted to get. And I, she's like, oh, well, you don't need your shoes. I was like, lady, I left my door unlocked. I got to go lock my door. She was like, oh, okay. She's like, but we got to hurry. We got to get back to the house where we're doing this. Even though she's already busted herself because she said she's going to do it at the very work. We got to get back to the house so I can take the less, this one that they're doing now home and we'll get you in there. He's like, the producer really doesn't like to wait. I was like, what was the last thing you said? Uh, the producer doesn't like to wait. And I was like, okay, no problem. So I ran back in the house and I picked up my son, the phone. And I called my son. I was like, I'm using you as an excuse to play along with what I say. She's like, okay. He says, okay. And so I, I had the phone actually on speakerphone. So she could hear I was actually on the phone. And she's sitting in my driveway. I, I told her I said, pull in my driveway. I wanted to make sure I got her license plate or vehicle fully on my security cameras because mm -hmm. I don't know if somebody's going to kidnap kids in the neighborhood or what the hell their, their issue right, is. Sure. There's too many crazies in this world. I actually kind of want to see if I can get her out of the car. So I kind of stood away from the door because she had her past driver's door open to see if I could get her to like get out of the car so I could get what she looked like on camera. It's like, I'm sorry, I really can't help you. My son just called me because she told me I could bring my cell phone, which I did anyway. And I was like, I've got to go pick him up for her. She's like, oh, I can drive you. And I'm like, no, I know you're really busy. You got this stuff to do. I was like, plus it's all the way downtown. She's like, no, let me drive you. I was like, lady, I said, my husband, or not my husband, but my dad can drive me. It's fine. She leans out of the car a little bit and she's talking to me. She says, you have cameras and jerks her head back in the car. I said, yeah, so I have a knife and know how to dial number one. You need to leave. And I walked to my house and she didn't waste no time leaving. I said, this bitch is crazy. This, okay, to protect you, to protect me, um, we're, we're going to record it, okay, okay? just because um, that way, you know, it doesn't look like you're hiding anything, it doesn't look okay. like I'm hiding anything, um, okay. that way I don't misconstrue something you say down the road, you know, like I misinterpreted something you said, or I thought you said one thing and you actually okay. said it, so, okay, so, again, I appreciate you coming up here and talking to us, um, I, I know that you wanted to come up here instead of um, talking to the scene, which is great, um, I guess, is there, a, just out of curiosity, is there a reason why you came up? Is it cooler here or something? No. Temperature -wise? The officer said that I'd have to go back to here to oh. repeat everything. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So. I, didn't, I didn't want to. But <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming up here with us, okay? And, and we'll take you home. Um, oh, I just want to go anywhere but to. there. Anywhere but there? So that's fair fine enough. to come here. Fair yeah. enough, fair enough. So, um, I, Ms. Huff, I don't know much um, about you. You keep throwing out these names and stuff like that, so I'm, I'm trying to stay on top of all this. But I guess let's let's start with, um, I really want to find out what happened today. So I'd like to get a very detailed account of like what happened today. And really what I'd like to do is, if, um, if at all possible, probably start maybe maybe like last night. You know, let's like work the 24 hours beforehand and, and work all the way through the incident. Make sure there's nothing that you saw or heard or something that might have happened or, or something like that. I don't want to miss anything. So let's, let's try to go back like 24 hours or so, maybe yesterday afternoon, lunch. Okay. Um, and let's work our uh, way forward. Yesterday I went to Best Buy and um, purchased some items and talked to the general manager there about getting a job for my nephew. Went home, got my nephew, said to bring him up, brought him up there. He talked to him for a little bit. We came back and we filled out some applications online. Um, went to Taco Bell, had lunch. Um, then I went home and then... So what time did you go to Best Buy, did you think? Uh, if you had to guess. Well, I was there right when it opened, so I think that's 10 o'clock. Oh. Because we had to wait in the parking lot a few minutes. Okay. Perfect. So I think it was 10 o'clock. St. Peter's one? Uh, yeah, by the mall. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And um, I was there, like I said, came all the way back to Fallon, got my nephew, went back up there, 
stayed up there a little bit, then we came back, had lunch, and I dropped him off. Oh, dropped him off, we filled out applications, three applications for Best Buy, instructions he had given us, and then I went home. And then um, walked my dog, fed him, did all that kind of stuff. My husband came home, we had, I left, and I went to Shop and Save at 3.30, okay. because that's when his chicken comes out fresh. Huh? So and he went a chicken breast. So which shop was it? Um, right there by my house, off of um, Mexico and K. Okay, oh. Mexico Loop Road there. Yeah, by, like across the street from the. Yeah, so that was like three thirty when I left. So we came home, we ate, and that was it. So it was rainy out and stuff like that. So we didn't go out. Walked my dog a couple more times. Watched the Olympics. Um, went to bed. Woke up this morning like I always do, and um, fed my dog. Walked him, and showered. Headed out to do errands and run around. I always stop at Conoco. I want to just slow you down a little bit because we're starting to rush through today. So you woke up. What time did you wake up this morning? Um, at seven thirty. Well, actually, I was up earlier because I had to let my son's dogs out. Um, probably about seven fifteen. Okay, so you wake up at seven fifteen. I forgot I did that. Sorry. That's good. Um, went and let my son's dogs out because he wasn't home. Where did your son live? Uh, like four streets over. Oh, okay, close. Yeah, that's where my nephew lives with him. There? I drive there. Right. And um, let his dogs out. Fed them, waited till they did their thing. Then I came back home, took care of my dog, fed them, walked them, uh, got in the shower, um, and headed out. And I had to get gas, so I went to Conoco down the street where I go every morning and get my soda. And which one's the Conoco? Uh, right past BP, it's across from like the fire station. The fire. Okay. Real little one. Yeah, down, kind of down in the valley. Yeah. Okay. By Magnolia Street. And you get that like every morning, you said? Every morning I go there because it's got a little car. There. About what time was that, do you think? Um, probably about 9, 9.15. Okay. Um, so I filled up, got my tank five card, got my soda, um, headed up towards um, the mall. And... Mid Rivers? Yeah, headed up towards, I don't think I went to Mid Rivers yet. Um, I was looking for uh, secondhand stores, because my sister in law is coming in town and that's what she does, she has stores. And she put stuff in. So I was looking for new ones because she was just here a couple weeks ago. So I went up Mexico Road um, and looked for a couple of them. I went up to Old O'Fallon. Um, I I'm, knew. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you when you, you went from Conoco and then you went straight to do this? Like up to yeah, the mall? Yeah, I'm just running around looking for. Right, it wasn't at the mall yet because they're not open okay. yet. I don't think they open until 10 or whatever. So I'm looking for stores for when she's coming in the 9th of September that we can go to. And so I went up Mexico looking. I went to Old O'Fallon. Down throughout that way, looking. I found a new one on um, K. Just looking for new ones. So I was driving around looking for new ones. Then I headed up to towards the mall. But I don't know because I was down in Mexico, so I just went to the mall. Went to Mexico to Mid Rivers. Did you I check? Did, like you say, I checked. I was looking for them or found something. I checked them out. Did you like go in any of these? No. Oh, we're just you didn't shop. You were just like looking for the locations. Yeah, but. we were in them when she was just here a week ago. So okay. we did a full week of that. So no, I did not. I'm just trying to find sites for. It. Um, so I got all the way to Mid Rivers and I went down, or Mexico to Mid Rivers, went down Mid Rivers to the mall. And I was going to go into, um, I had to go to the bathroom. So, where did I stop? I want to say, um, oh, the bread company right there by, um, I don't know. Bread company. It's, like the one right here in Valley? Or no, by the mall. By the mall? Is that by Barnes and Noble? No. Oh. It's across the street. It's by what's Pier One. Okay. It's right by Pier One. I think it's new. Oh, yeah. I stopped in there, went to the bathroom, okay. and because um, I've been drinking my soda. So stopped in there. What time um, do you think that might have been? If you, like just before ten, or just, cause you said the mall opens at ten. Didn't open at ten, yeah. Um, I don't know what time it was. I wasn't looking at the clock then oh. or anything like that. Um, I was gonna go into Pier One, and I didn't change my mind because it was right there. So um, I went up to go up to Hobby Lobby. Which is off of Cave Springs. Yep, right around. And um, I went up there and I decided not to go in there. And since I was up there, my daughter lives up that way and she's a teacher. So I didn't know if she was in school yet. So I went by her house to see if she was home. And um, I didn't see her car. So I drove back. And that's when um, I was going to go back to the mall. So I came home because I knew I had to let the dog out then. So I came home, let the dog out. So you went by, I'm sorry, you went by whose house? My daughter, who lives off of uh, Sarah. Go ahead, I'm sorry to be interrupted. Um, you said she lives off of what? Um, you take First Capital. I don't want to go to Sarah. I understand. She's a teacher, so 
Johnny Depp um, off the first camera. Um, and she wasn't there. I just drove down the street, she wasn't there. Sure. Um, so, um, so you said you circle back and went home? Yeah, I just went, I got caught, behind, or came back down and went through, um, just cut through where Lennon was, she lives right there. Cut through there and got on the highway and went home. And then what? Um, I got home, opened up the garage, pulled in, got my dog, walked him out in front so he could go pee, and he did. He did his thing. Um, went back, put him inside, gave him a treat. <coughs> Came back out. I'm gonna run back up to the mall. Uh, I was supposed to pick up a purchase that I had from Best Buy. He had to make an appointment. My appointment's Friday. I was gonna run up there see if I could get it early. Um, so I was gonna run back up there. And as I, st I started pulling out and got halfway out. I noticed as I was backing up that a car came down really fast on the cross street and whipped around right in front of my driveway because I'm right at the end. Here's the cross street and here's my driveway. So oh. they came out and did this right in front of my driveway and I looked up because it was so fast and startling and somebody jumped out and I was like, wow, somebody, I don't know what I thought, somebody was hurt, I don't know what was going on. It was so fast and then he ran up, I was halfway out to drive where I was parked and he jumped in my car, he opened up the door and jumped in my car. Which door? The uh, passenger. Front or back? Oh, front. Or passenger front. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And um, he had a bunch of stuff in his hands. I don't know what he had, but he had a knife also. But he had something in his other arm. I don't know what he had. And um, he put a knife and kept going, um, just yelling random stuff like, you're going to take me to the bank and get Russ's money. Take me to the bank. You're going to take me to the bank. He put a knife up to my throat there and was yelling stuff. And um, he kept looking behind him like this. So I didn't, I put it in gear and I was thinking how I was gonna get out of there when he was looking and he kept yelling, coming back and then he looked back again and I hit his arm with the knife and then shot out of the car and ran inside. Okay, so you were, I uh, just wanna make sure I understand. So you were, all, you'd already been home, fed the dog, gave him a street, and you were getting ready to leave. So when you, when you got home, did you leave the car in the driveway or did you pull in the garage? I was in the garage. Okay, so you pulled the car all the way in? Yes. And then you got out and you tended to the dog? No, I did not pull it in the garage. I always pull it in the garage when I'm going to stay. But no, I stayed right there because I was leaving. Okay, so, so right where it was. So where it was where still it was, running. Yeah, okay. I just ran in to, to let him out. Okay, so you were only in the house just a couple, couple well, minutes just, more? Oh, not even a couple minutes, just enough to put his leash on. I brought him out, walked him, blah, blah, blah. Okay. All that kind of stuff. How do you go in the house when you pulled in the driveway to go in? How did you go in the house? Through what door? The garage door. Okay. The garage, the big one was open, and I ran through the garage door. Okay, okay so then kind of rush through that. I just want to make sure I understand. So you went in, you let the dog out, you gave him a treat, you're ready to leave again. So you come back out of the house. How did you exit the house? How? Out the same door. Same door? Okay. Yeah, I let him in the same door because the front door was locked. Okay. So I was coming in, I come in and out that door. Um, came out that door, got back in the car Okay. to go again. Okay. And that's when the car shot around and somebody jumped out. Before I knew it, they were sitting next to me. Okay, so let's first describe the car. Can, can you give a description of the vehicle? Well, I wasn't really paying attention to the vehicle, more of the um, shriekness of their tires that they did. It was a, just a silver, um, wasn't as small as like a little Toyota, a little bit bigger, but not a big one sitting in. It was four doors. So four door, mm -hmm. mid, you would say mid-size? Yeah, that? probably mid-size. Wasn't brand new. Um, I mean, as you reflect back, do you remember anything anything specific about, other than being silver and being four doors, anything on it? You said it, it wasn't that new. No, it else? wasn't like shiny, like you could tell it was, like my crash, I just hit a 2004 Honda, kind of like older like that, you know, not that it was a piece of crap or anything, but it was, yeah. It was a veteran car. Yeah, grocery getter. And then, um, that's all I remember about it. It was just so fast, like I wasn't really even looking at the car. It was like, what's this hastiness that this car is doing? This, Quickness. I didn't know what was going on. It was just getting. It was just weird. It was getting weird, and it was like because they tore around. And he popped out, and I'm like, my first thought was, did I know him? Because they did it so fast. But then I was like, and I looked back down, and the next thing I knew, he was there. So. Okay. So, as I I was I was up there for a few minutes, and I noticed that there was a, an orange car parked on the street. That's my next door neighbor's. Okay, next door neighbor's down. car. Okay, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. I didn't know where it that came from. Okay. I know. So, you're trying to remember how your street is, which way did the, so if you're sitting in your car, pointed at the right. garage, which way did this car come from? Um, right here, the right side, that, that low street there. 
don't know what it's called. So the street behind you. Behind me, yes. This is the way I, uh, and I probably have you draw it out later, but so not, so the street behind you. Mm -hmm. I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I remember being there. Okay. It's almost, it's directly behind my neighbor's driveway, okay. and I'm one over. So I can, I can see them whip around, come out of there. Okay. And all they did was come right around, right to my house. Okay. So he jumps out of the car, he jumps into the passenger front side of your car. Mm -hmm. and Where does he jump out of the silver car from? I don't know. They asked me that. I really wasn't paying attention. I, I want to say the back seat, but that may not be true. I keep trying to remember. I thought, and that may not be true. Were there other people in the vehicle? There was a driver. All I saw was a driver um, because he squealed away. So I was like, what the hell? And he looked. Uh, what was the most distinctive thing about the driver that you remember? Dark hair. was kind of like a buzz cut um, and dark skin, like um, Hispanic, maybe, something like that. It, what crosses my mind, I don't know. It could be anybody. I don't know if they were Hispanic, but um, that's what crossed my mind. Okay, so you got, you got somewhat of a look at the driver. Yeah. Come. Yeah, because when he started to whip around, I all I saw was like a dark dome, sorry, but um, short hair like you. Right. Short, maybe not quite as short, but it was dark. And, I was, and that's foreign in that neighborhood. It's all the same people. Were there windows open in their vehicle, you know? Uh, no, not that I saw. And so that's the only other person you saw in the vehicle that you can remember? Yeah, because I really wasn't looking for people. I just noticed him when he went real fast to turn, and I looked up, and I just happened to see the driver because that's who was coming around and didn't even see the other person until they whipped in front of my driveway, and he got out. Because at then, I wasn't really, I wasn't just staring at him. When it first happened, and I heard it, and I saw it, I was like, it was just weird. And then they hurry, and I looked up again, and they, that's when they whipped, and I was like, weird and kind of look down again because I'm getting about my business and they didn't keep going <laughs> he got out and then the other guy squealed away real fast and he was already there before so the guy squealed away mm -hmm. before before he, well, I don't know what the words about at what point did he get out did he squeal away well with, with in comparison to what the other guy was doing right as soon as he pulled around and I wasn't looking again I looked back down to put you know to get ready to go and stuff and um, I pulled around and I looked up again, the guy had shot out. When he pulled around, the guy like shot out and I looked down again and thought, it's kind of strange, I don't even know if I thought it was strange, but it was weird. And so I looked up again as he was getting out and he squealed right off. The guy squealed right off. Like, I assume he shut the door, but I don't even know because I wasn't looking at that. I could hear it in that and I was more looking at like, who's getting out of the car, you know? Is it somebody I know? Because they're right in front of my driveway. Okay. So, so that guy squeals away. The guy jumps in the passenger seat of the car. I, I know you described him as having a knife in one hand and something else in he the other. Some, yeah. Well, he had popped in when he opened up the door, and I don't know what I even what I was thinking. I don't even I don't even know. He just was in there so fast. But I know he was jumbling something in this arm, and had a knife in the other hand. And then um, he switched. Somehow, I don't know if he set his stuff down or dropped, I don't know what he did, but he had to put the knife in the other hand then. So, um, and that's when he put it up here. Okay, you, you're using your right hand, Is that, are you right or left handed? I'm right handed. Okay. Did you use your right hand because you're right handed or did you use your right hand because that's how you recall it when it happened? Or? Um, that's how I recall that it happened. Because he had something in his right hand when he first got in and then the first few seconds, I didn't see a knife or anything. I know he just had stuff, you know, and I was just like freaked out. And then all of a sudden, he dropped stuff, and then he had a knife. So I don't, I'm guessing right. Okay. So, what if anything did he say? He said, "You're going to take me to the bank and get Russ's money. We're going now. So get going." Type stuff, and he just kept yelling stuff like that at me. And um, so, at this time, I still don't, I don't have it in gear or anything. Or I do have it. No, I don't have it in gear. And I had put it in gear to go because I didn't know what to do. And then I, that's when I noticed he was looking back. I don't know what, if he was looking because cars, I don't know what he was looking at. But he kept looking back and I noticed that. So I put it back in the gear and he said, get going right now. We're going to the bank. And then he looked back again like this and I hit his arm and I shot out of the car. So when you say I put it back in the gear, mm -hmm. you mean you put it back in park? Mm -hmm. Okay. So right. my plan was to get out of the car somehow. So when he came up and approached you at the car door and got in, your, the vehicle was in reverse with your foot on the brake? Yes. Okay. Our, oh, I don't know. I don't know if it was still in park or in reverse. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, so we described, you kind of described the guy in the silver. I think it was in reverse, but I'm, 
I can't swear to it. I don't know if I put it in reverse when he said let's go or if I already had it in reverse. I don't know because I kept looking at him and kind of what was, I was miscombobbled on what the hell was going on with the situation. And next thing I know, he's there. Okay. At that point, no, oh, you know what? I don't think I, I think I, no, it wasn't, I wasn't in gear. My car was running. I had left my car running when I came out. I came out, so it was in park. So I don't think I ever did put it in gear. Okay. Okay. So you described the the, the driver of the vehicle to the best you know to the best of your ability what you saw. Describe the guy that got in the vehicle with you. The guy who got in with me he had on shorts, he had on blue shorts, shortish hair, sandy blonde. Um, and now forgive me, I, I have not I did not go in the scene. I've not been in the scene. Okay. So is he a white male, black male, oh, I'm sorry. Hispanic male? He's white male. White male. Uh, he's taller than me. Um, he had blue. Gym shorts on, um, and some sort of t-shirt, and sandy blonde hair, and I want to say his eyes were blue, but I'm not sure. It's not like they were like a bright blue or anything like that, noticeable. But I want to say they were light colored eyes. They weren't brown. Okay. I don't think. I could be wrong. I really wasn't looking at his face. No, anything. Any smells? He didn't, no, he didn't smell. The only thing I noticed was is he's yelling and getting more and more upset. He was slurring his words. I thought he was drunk. I didn't smell anything at all. But he did have, I don't know what he had with him, but he kept, like the more he kept repeating himself, he was getting all excited and he was, uh, I thought he was drunk or on drugs or something like that because I couldn't understand him half the time. Right. He was yelling crap, I couldn't even understand him. So he was slurring his words, but he didn't really smell of anything mm -hmm. at all. He didn't smell he, anything. Was he sweaty? Was he dirty? Was he clean? Well, he didn't stink. Okay. Is he... I didn't notice, like, greasy hair, like a homeless person or anything like that. Okay. Um, he just looked like a normal person to okay. me. I mean, he wasn't clean cut, like, like you guys, like you're groomed. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't dirty, because I didn't smell anything or see, like, nasty hair or anything. What, what age? About what age would you put him in? Late 30s. And of course, it begs the question. I, I don't know that we just asked you straight. Have you ever seen this guy before? No. Don't know him. Um, he doesn't look like somebody you've seen somewhere before with somebody else. I mean, as you as you remember back, you know, as you picture him in your mind, um, there there is you cannot make any link between this guy and and you. No. I mean. I wasn't looking directly at his face. I was trying not to look at him. I do know when he did get in, there was something familiar about him, but I don't know him. So I don't know if I, met, I don't know. He seemed familiar, like I should know him, but I do not know him. And forgive me if Kevin Kev asks this. Did he have, I know you say he's a Caucasian male, mm -hmm. but did he have any type of accent that was noticeable to you? I didn't know, because he was, well, he was bumbling, slurring, and at first, I didn't really notice anything, but like I said, he was getting so excited and stuff. He, as he was yelling at me, I mean, it was like he was drunk. I mean, he would let, I literally, like his tongue was this thick. I didn't know what was going on. I figured he was on something, alcohol or something. I didn't know. I, I knew something was not right because as he was getting excited, it was getting worse. Okay. The slurring was getting worse? Yes. The stumbling on his yeah. person? Okay. Yeah, I couldn't hardly understand what he was saying. I could pick out like certain words, but he said one phrase inside made no sense. He said, you know, I think he said it out in the garage or out in the car too. Uh, something about killing my wife. Something, and I'm like, I mean, he didn't say anything, but it was weird. He His said, wording. He said it out in the car. He said it out in the car, yelling at me, and when he was saying he was going to kill me. Okay. So what are the things, of the things that you could understand him say, what are the things that he said to you? He, well, first it was kind of clear, in the car, because he wanted me to go to the bank to get Russ's money. And How did he say that? He said, he said some curse words, and then he said, we're, we're going. We can say those here. Yeah, let me just be, tell us what he said. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, yeah. well, a lot I couldn't understand, but he said, when he first got in, and he had the, I was, I think I was yelling at him, I don't even remember, I think I was like, who are you, get out of my car, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, bitch, we're going to the bank, and I'm like, and then my mind just starts swirling because I'm like, going to the bank, this is so freaking weird. And I'm like, I'm not going to the bank with you. Get out of my car. And he goes, bitch, you go, we're going to the bank, we're getting Russ's money. And, and he started getting all agitated and excited. And that's when I really, he was yelling things. I wasn't listening because 
I was forming how the hell I was going to get out of the car. So he was yammering crap, couldn't really understand him at that point, and my thought was to get the, the knife away and get the heck out of the car. That's all I was thinking about at that point. What he was saying, I don't know. As I ran into the garage, he ran after me, I heard the car door shut, and he was yammering stuff again about killing me. Again, my focus was to get in the house. I knew I had my phone in my pocket. I was trying to dial 911. I think I did it three times before it went through on my cell phone. But then I was inside, and he was trying to get the door. I was trying to hold the door. I couldn't get it locked then. And I was trying to get 911 on the phone. And he was saying stuff. And then the door flew open. He got in. It flew open. And I ran into the bedroom. He was yelling stuff. And as I was going in the bedroom, something again about killing my wife, him and Stevie. Me and Stevie, you're gonna kill your wife. And I, so I don't know who that is. I don't know a Steven or a Stevie or a Steve. I don't know what he was talking about. He was so then, so but uh, It was really hard. It's like his sentences weren't formed by then. Mm -hmm. And so none of it made any sense, but he did keep saying, get in the car. I ran in the bedroom. I tried to, you know, I shut that door. I was trying to get it locked, wouldn't latch. Got a problem with the door. And um, I got my gun, turned around, got my gun. I stand right there and he was pounding on the door. And once it flew open, when I shot him, and I just kept shooting him, because he just kept standing there. How many times did you say you pulled the trigger? I unloaded the whole gun. Okay. So you I pulled the trigger until it stopped firing? I just kept pulling until it stopped. Okay, so, and again, because I haven't been there yet, and I don't know what, I don't know what it looks like, um, did any rounds go, are, are there going to be any bullet holes in the door, uh, into the bedroom, or do you think that no. the door was fully I open? was in the bedroom. I, I understand was, that, but you said the door flew open, so... I didn't, yeah, I didn't start shooting until that door flew open and he was standing right there ready to approach him to the bedroom. And I just started shooting and walking towards him. So I, wanted be, I wanted to be sure I hit him. Because everybody kept saying that's a little gun and blah, 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 and I gotta, gotta be a club. So once that door opened and he was there, I just started shooting and walking towards him until I didn't have any more. Um, I don't want to jump too far ahead too fast, but um, inside the room, how's your. I'm gonna have, I'm, you know what I'm gonna end up doing is I'm gonna end up getting some pieces of paper and having you sketch out some things like I your bedroom. You know what? If this garage door is here, bedroom's right there. No, I know, but like I'm yeah, talking about like, no, I understand that, point. but like where the bed is inside. Oh, okay. like, I, I, need okay. to, I just want to figure out where you were standing, where he was standing. Um, well, I'm standing right. Because I have not walked in oh, the okay. house. I have yeah. no I, I, I can All I can do is go off the visual of what yeah. you're telling me. And I, other than that, I haven't seen any pictures or anything. Yeah, there's only three pieces of furniture in the bedroom. And the nightstand, as you walk in the door, is right here. So I ran right for it, got my gun. Okay, so the bed is the bed on the far wall? Yeah. Well, let me just, let me just, you know what, I'm gonna step out for a second, get some white pieces of paper, okay. and I'll be right back, so okay. sit right in. Should I tell him, or just wait? Yeah, just just wait. Hold on, just make it on a piece of paper. It's easier to visualize it if we're seeing it actually draw on. You got it on water? Yeah. Okay. So daily driving, driving around? Time. No, they're for reading. Okay, so where did those come from? I hit them on my shirt, so. Okay. Yeah, so I you, always keep them here. Okay, and then you. I'm good. And let you go, oh, you know, something here, something like that, and I have to have them. So I always keep glasses here. Okay. We're um, we, not in your house in the hallway. Is it, is it well lit? Is it with the lights on? No, lights were on, but I have uh, most of the windows open and stuff. So. Is this? Yeah, it's not dark. The bedroom's plenty light. It's not dark. And I'm, no, the bedroom's dark. The bedroom's dark. Because of, why is it dark? Um, because the drapes are closed. Oh, so it's always those two it's a dark have drapes, it's dark. Yeah, they have, and, and they have blinds underneath. And it's just always we keep it dark because my husband likes it nice and cool in at night because it's just how it is all the time. I mean, it's not like dark, like night dark. It's dark for the day. I mean, it's if you shut your drapes in your bedroom, that's what it's like. Sure. I'm with it. Okay. I'm trying to think of all the details here. Go ahead. Obviously, there's some history with it with past things, and that's why they said they wanted Russ's money, correct? They said something about Russ, mm -hmm. going to the bank. Kind of got to dig in a little bit. He said, at one point, the money that I stole from Russ. At one point in the car, you know, because he kept saying, we're going to the bank, you're getting Russ's money, and I'm like, get out of my car, who are you, what are you talking about? At first, I didn't even know what the hell he was talking about, and at one point, he had said the money you stole from Russ. Why well, I said that, you guys discussed that all the time? Uh, no, I mean. I think I told yeah, you from one of the other officers. Okay. Yeah. He had said that at some point, and that, and still, it didn't click with me. I was just worried about getting out of there. And then what the hell? The guy was so thick-tongued that even when he said stuff, it took, with everything going on and how he was talking, a second for like, what the hell is this guy talking about? It just was so mumble jumbled. Didn't make sense. Some of them were complete sentences. Um, it, was, it was frightening. Can, not to get too personal here, but can you kind of fill me in, fill us in, in on the financial aspect of 
the free stuff and where all that stands yeah. now. Um, she had signed over I mean, as beneficiary, and I was paid out. How much? One hundred fifty thousand. Okay. And I still have that one hundred fifty thousand. Okay. And that's known to people that I still have the one hundred fifty thousand because broadcasted that because at one point when I was talking to prosecutors up in Lincoln County, she kept on like, "Yeah, there, money? Can I see your account? You know, whatever." And I just brought it up to her in cash and gave it to her. And so when I was at trial you, for it, you, it, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That was the judge asking for that? Or the no, prosecutor? prosecutor. Prosecutor. She was asking to see if I still had it. She okay. goes, do you still have them? Okay. And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, can you show me that you still have it? Okay. Better. So you brought it to her. And I did. And okay. I brought up a bag and I gave it to her. And I had cash in it. And then when I was at the trial with the girls for the money. So you took the money out of my bag? Yeah, sure? I did. You couldn't just bring her a bank receipt? I didn't have a bank receipt. No. Had, okay, no. You had cash. cash. Okay. At that time. All right. At that time. So now so it's a cash in the bag. But, now it's a cash. Yeah. But um, it was. But um. I have to remember again, I had brain injury, so a lot of stuff right. that makes sense to me doesn't Listen, make sense. I know everybody goes, you're in that case. I'm not, I didn't say that at all. That makes sense to me at that time. Fair enough. Different so then I went to trial. The girls tried to sue me for the money, though they had never been beneficiary. Russ was the beneficiary. Okay. And um, they lost. Okay. But at that trial, Russ was there. Okay. So he knew. Was this after, when was this in relation to his This just happened criminal? in January. He just got out. So he, he had just been released when you went back to trial for the daughters. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he knew the cash story. Okay. And he knew, because he was sitting behind us at the trial, that I still had the money. Okay. And right after um, after that, um, the place, I don't think he knows this, but the place where I had my hair done, um, him and his cousin went there and confronted a hairdresser there. Was this on phone? Yeah, and the police were called and I everybody. Yeah, okay. and because somebody wrote something on Facebook. That's how violent he is. And they came and were screaming at this poor girl because they didn't like what she wrote. And I know there was a gun involved with the owner. That everybody was getting that worked up and stuff. The police were called. I don't know what happened to it. I do know that um, talking to the prosecutor and stuff. At St. Charles or Lincoln? Lincoln. Okay. Um, Channel 2 Fox News, Chris Hayes was notified and decided to suppress that story because he didn't want it out about it, which I blame him for. This guy has behavior. He's already had the one gal do this to me. He's already confronted another one violently and now this. So I blame him for suppressing that. He suppressed it because he's working with a defense lawyer when they were getting him out, and now he's taking him on the book round and stuff, Chris Hayes So I blame him for suppressing that because people should have known that. Should have known what specifically? The, that he that. was that crazy. That if you say anything or do anything, he's going to be right there up in your face because he's out now. We're talking about Russ. Mm -hmm. When's the last time? Have you ever had any conversations with him through any medium, social media, phone, in person with Russ? At the um, girls' trial in January. Um, he was there, and he's just kept lurking around and all that. And um, we kind of ran into each other, going to the bathroom and stuff on a break. And I said to him, oh, congratulations on your release. I'm not straight home. I was just being nice. And uh, he said, oh, thanks. And that was it. Turned around and walked away. He had, like, his cousin left on. Just his cousin, the same cousin that confronted this hairdresser. So um, that's the last time I've seen him. Or, and that's, we didn't really speak. We just said that. So nice days. We did nice January. Mm -hmm. I think it was in January. Okay. No other contact since? No. All right. So that was in January that the daughters lost their case to get the money. Mm -hmm. Is there any other legal procedures going on with it currently? It's, uh, well, they're appealing. Okay. Yeah. So they're appealing, okay. Yeah, they're appealing. Where's that at, do you know, in the court it's, process? Oh, I think it's going to be a lawsuit. Okay. Yeah. It's a paper thing. All right. Okay. Because um, when you're stating this person who got in the car said something about Russ, that's why we got to kind of... Well, yeah, because that's what's wrong. At first it didn't even click with me. I know, but again, hard to understand. My mind was going somewhere else to get out of there, so it literally like was a split screen for me him just at first i understood what he was saying and then i was just concentrating on my own little world and he was just saying crap yeah right. when you knocked the gun out or the, you know, the knife do you know did it fall out of his hand or did it stay in his hand i hit it as hard as i could or i hit him and i think it fell okay. in my mind it fell okay. didn't stop to look i at the same time opened the door and just ran out all right we have no idea what else was in his hand when he came after me well, yeah, you said he, when you have the cars. No, but, but he was jumbling something. something. But it should be in the car, right? Yeah. Yeah, it should be in the car. And I should be in the car if it got knocked out because unless he had it in my house and it's in my house, it's from the car to my house. If the knife's got to be there and whatever the hell he had was there. Okay. All right, your written statement. Yeah. Why don't we, I, I know, I know we just talked at length about about what happened um, today. I just did one of those. Where? In the ambulance. Okay, um, was it as detailed as what we've just discussed here? I think so, yeah. I think so? Okay. You know what I'll do? I'm going to go track it down. Okay. I'll, I'll read through it and maybe might have you come back and clarify some things for me if the, if the statement wasn't too terribly clear. Okay. Um, you said you haven't eaten lunch or anything? Is it, are you hungry or you're okay? Okay. Is your water okay for now? No, sorry. You good? Okay. Give us a few minutes and we'll be back, okay? You need something? Yeah, just let us know. We're right out of here. Thanks. 
Don't think I'm smoking out. Okay, I'm sorted. I think I. I Up killed Lewis in a staged home invasion to make it look like Russ Feria, Betsy's exonerated husband, had sent someone to kill her. However, investigators quickly uncovered the truth, using evidence such as Pam's phone records, which placed her near Louis's residence prior to the murder. Pam's plot to frame Russ backfired. While Louis's murder initially appeared as self-defense, further investigation led to her arrest. Carol's encounter with Pam provided crucial evidence that helped put Pam behind bars for Louis Gumpenberger's murder. Pam later entered an Alford plea in 2019, admitting that the evidence was sufficient for a conviction while maintaining her innocence. Her twisted attempts to avoid suspicion in Betsy Faria's murder culminated in her being charged with that crime in 2021, a decade after it happened. Pam is currently serving life in prison for Louis Gumpenberger's death and awaits trial for the murder of Betsy Feria. Due to these incidents, investigators went back into the death of Pam's mother, Shirley Newman. According to Pam, Shirley accidentally fell from a balcony and died. Four months before Shirley's fall from her third floor balcony, Hupp mentioned to police, if I wanted money, my mom's worth half a million that I get when she dies. This comment, along with the unusual circumstances surrounding Shirley's death, where balcony railings were mysteriously broken, led to questions about foul play. Initially ruled an accident, the manner of death was changed to undetermined after the investigation, but the case remains open. Neumann had eight times the normal dose of the sedative Zolpidem in her system. And though Hupp was with her before the fall, police never thoroughly interviewed her about the incident. Pam Hupp's story gained national attention, culminating in the creation of The Thing About Pam, a six-part true crime miniseries released in 2022. The series, produced by NBC, dramatizes the events surrounding the murder of Betsy Faria, Russ Faria's wrongful conviction, and Pam's involvement, all based on the extensive coverage by Dateline and True Crime Reporting. As for Carol and Russ, they met after their shared connection with the Hupp case. Russ, wrongfully convicted for Betsy's murder, served four years in prison before being exonerated. Carol, who narrowly escaped becoming a victim of Hupp's scheme, believes her encounter with Pam played a significant role in helping investigators build their case. Carol and Russ eventually connected through the media attention surrounding the case, and they later formed a relationship and got married, united by the dark circumstances they endured. Currently, Russ Feria has settled lawsuits against officials involved in his wrongful conviction and continues to live a quiet life with Carol, away from the spotlight as much as possible. Carol has expressed no regrets about her encounter with Pam Hupp, believing it helped bring justice in the Lewis Gumpenberger case and is focused on moving forward with her life. Pam Hupp, on the other hand, is serving a life sentence for Gumpenberger's murder and awaits trial for the murder of Betsy Faria, while investigators have reopened the investigation into her mother Shirley Newman's suspicious death. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you'd like to learn more about Pam Hupp, Russ Faria, Carol McAfee, and the ongoing investigations, check out the links in the show notes. You'll find articles, videos, and updates on the upcoming trials and investigations. Be sure to subscribe for future episodes and updates on this case and others. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time.